Oh, this is great. There's just so many people here. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the science of birdsong. I'm going to talk about um, my own career in birdsong and why I do the things I do and how I got interested in stuff. So my story starts in San Diego, California, January 30th, 1977, eight pounds, two ounces. Born to uh, Joan Marie Logue and John Logue. So mom stayed home and raised me and my sisters. She was, you know, very loving, very caring mom. She, uh, she really encouraged me uh, in the things I was interested in, even if she didn't understand them totally, you know. And dad, dad was a, uh, a computer engineer. He's retired now. Computer engineer worked in, like, uh, California tech companies, like Intel and Xilinx and stuff like that. Both really supportive. Dad, one thing I remember Dad telling me that's relevant to tonight's talk is he was, um, he told me that you have to work a lot in your life. When you're an adult, you have to work a lot. You have to work many, many hours. So you need to find a job that you like. You need to find a job that you would do even if you didn't get paid. So there were early signs, <laughs> certain proclivities, maybe. So we were in San Diego, and uh, in 82, my parents moved the family to Northern California. And, uh, and we lived in the foothills outside of a town called Placerville, California. It's like down the hill from Lake Tahoe. And uh, in the summertime, mom would have to kick us out of the house, right? Because otherwise we would just be in her hair all the time. So she'd kick us out so she could get some work done around the house. And we had to figure out something to do to keep ourselves entertained outside. And for me, I, I quickly realized that I could look for little animals. I could look for frogs and snakes and lizards and things. And I just love that. I just couldn't get enough of it. I love to find different things. And I'd put them in a jar, and I'd try to keep them alive and feed them and stuff. We had, um, I went to this little country school, and we had a, a little library. And we'd have book day. Every couple weeks, we'd go to the library and check out a book. But I just checked out the same book over and over again. I used to read it like a, like a story. I'd just read it from the beginning to the end. I'd just look at all the, all the pictures of all the different animals and think about how much I'd like to catch the different kinds, how I'd like to see them, and I'd memorize their names and try to figure out what it was that I could find. Another book that I really liked as a kid was Dr. Doolittle. So I read all of them. I read all of them as a kid. This was before the movie. So if anybody doesn't know, Dr. Doolittle uh, is a physician. These are children's books, right? He's a physician. He's a doctor. And, um, and his parrot teaches him how to talk to the animals. And so he has the ability to talk to animals, and he uses this ability to go on all kinds of adventures and to help animals out, and they help him, and he makes friends with the animals and whatever. And I like this. I like, I would catch these things. I'd put them in a jar. I'd have this snake or whatever. And I had this idea, remember I was a kid, so I didn't really understand how things work, but I had this idea that the animals had this complex world. They had their own lives, and they were doing something, and adults weren't interested enough. They didn't, weren't paying close enough attention. But if you could pay attention, you could learn what was happening. You could understand better what was in the mind of the animal, and that we could, we could really learn something from that. So I wanted to do that. And I, so Dr. Doolittle, he... He got it. Like, he, he, <laughs> he understood where I was coming from because he understood that there was something there that was worth paying attention to. And I really I, I believe that. Um, we lived out in the country, and so we didn't have that many TV stations. And, uh, and I ended up having to watch PBS a lot just because there wasn't cartoons on or whatever. And I remember one of my favorite shows on PBS was I liked, I liked all the nature documentaries, really. I liked Wild America with Marty Stauffer, and I liked Mutual of Omaha. They had this thing called Wild Kingdom where they'd go out and chase people. Some, of, some folks were nodding their heads, right? Marlon Perkins would go off and chase lions. Marlon Perkins, that's right. And I love Jacques Cousteau. But this is my favorite one right here. See if, this, see if this strikes any chords of nostalgia.
So when I saw that intro, you know, I just knew that I was going to get like an hour of solid nature. I was going to get to see some really cool animals and some really cool plants and something interesting was going to happen. And there's this one episode that I remember really distinctly as a kid. And I was able to find it. So all these old episodes are on YouTube now, which is amazing. But I was able to find this old episode on YouTube, and it was about Central America. And I just, I remember as a kid just thinking this was just the most, this is where I needed to be. I really, really wanted to go to Central America. It seemed extremely exotic. There were all these different things, all these different plants and animals that I'd never seen before and that people didn't understand. It seemed like it, seemed like it was just full of mystery. Like there was just so much going on there. And I wanted to go, I wanted to go see it. I wanted to go learn about it. So I'll play a little clip here. Something, this clip, I probably saw this in like 1984. Uh, when it came out, but I remembered it my whole life, and I just found it on YouTube. So here's a short little clip about a sloth. Moving slowly has another advantage. It allows the sloth's hair to stay permanently damp. And together with the forest's high humidity, this provides ideal conditions for green algae to grow. As a result, its greenish, unkempt appearance actually enhances its camouflage. And I thought that was just great. <laughs> it, it hit all the right notes for a young David Logue because it, it was weird. I liked weird, uh, you know, unusual, exotic things. And the sloth is definitely very weird. And the idea that it had this relationship with the algae that was somehow useful and beneficial, that different living things would have these relationships with each other and that that could evolve, that was super interesting to me. I was really, this is like that little factoid that it had algae in its fur and that made it better camouflaged. I remember that for my whole life, because I saw it in this PBS documentary. And I remember thinking, somebody had to figure that out. Somebody had to pay enough attention to what was going on and figure out that this was what was happening. And then it got into this documentary. And I remember thinking, oh, I want to be, this is what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be the person who figures stuff out about nature so that people can put it into documentaries and, and people would learn about it later. So it was like, I kind of wanted to be like, like a, an envoy or like an ambassador to the wild world, you know, to the, to the world of, of plants and animals and stuff. And it was to the point where when my fourth grade teacher had us all write down what we wanted to be when we grew up, she pulled one out of a jar and she's, oh wow, that's, that's long. She was, Somebody here wants to be a tropical ecologist. But it wasn't a totally linear path. I got older. I got into friends and girls and music and stuff. I got really into music. I played in a bunch of bands. This is my first band. This is maybe one of our first shows. This is a school talent show. You can tell we're in a gym there. So that's me on the bass. I think we were okay. Our sound man, I, I don't know if he agreed. So by the time I got into university, I, uh, I kinda, I'd kind of fallen away from this idea of, of studying plants and animals. And, and uh, I don't know, you know, being a high schooler is kind of a weird time in life. And I think I was trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. and and. You know, music was something that everybody kind of appreciated, and I felt like that was kind of part of my identity at that point. I said, well, you know, maybe I'll just be a physician, because that's uh, a good, respectable job, and, you know, I can do biology or whatever. So I got to UC San Diego, and I had my first year there, and I was pulling bees, and I felt pretty good about that, because, you know, it was a hard school, and that's fine. And I was, I, I guess I was kind of floating. Mostly I was doing what a lot of 18-year-olds do, which is trying to figure out who I was and, and what I wanted to do with my life. And so after that first year of getting bees and, you know, meeting a lot of friends and having an interesting time, I, uh, I was spending the summer away from school and my parents discovered that I was partying a lot. And, and, uh, and, they, didn't, and they didn't totally support that. In fact, they didn't financially support that. And so... <laughs> I became financially independent that moment. <laughs> and I, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do because I was out of school, right? I couldn't go back to school because they were paying for school. And I didn't have a car or anything. I wasn't even in San Diego anymore. I was stuck up in Northern California. 
And so I had to apply for scholarships and loans and stuff. And during that year, I was very poor. I was eating a lot of bean burritos. I just never had enough money to do the things I needed to do. And it occurred to me that I should, I should pursue, I should follow my dad's advice. I should pursue a profession that I really loved, something that uh, kind of came naturally to me. And so I did get back into school, and I, uh, I changed my major right away to ecology, behavior, and evolution. I was majoring in music before. I changed to ecology, behavior, and evolution. And uh, really, my whole outlook on school and everything changed um, because now I had a clear direction of where I wanted to go, and I felt responsible for myself in a way that I hadn't before, I guess. And uh, yeah, just straight A's from there. And, and I, it's not like I even realized that was happening. I, just, I was just studying all the time because I was doing something I really loved. And a big part of it was this class in animal communication. So I was lucky to have gone to UC San Diego, which was dumb luck. I went to UC San Diego because I liked San Diego and my grandma lived there. But I, I was lucky to go there because there were these professors, Jack Bradbury and Sandy Varenkamp, and they were world's experts in animal communication. And they, uh, when I took the class, actually, they hadn't even written their book yet. They, um, what we'd do, we'd go to this place called Soft Reserves on campus, and you'd buy a big stack of photocopies that were the class notes, and then you'd have to put them in binders and stuff. Then anyway, after that, I took the class. I loved the class. I TA'd for the class after that, and they'd published this book. And so now this is sort of the textbook on animal communication. I actually teach out of the second edition of this right now in my animal communication class at the U of L. And so I learned the basics of animal communication in this class. And the way that they taught it was in terms of this sender and receiver model. So, so the basic model is there's some signal sender who produces a signal. The signal travels through the environment. It could be like air or water or something like that. It's received by a signal receiver, and, and then the signal receiver responds to the signal. So it's this sender and receiver model of communication. We'll get back to that later on. That's also where I learned um, about how to analyze sound. So a tricky thing about sound, including bird sounds, is that they're, they're fast and they're transient. So they're just gone. So the bird sings, and then it's just gone, right? What frequency was that? How many notes were there? What was the duration of each of those notes? Right? It's, that's, it's not here anymore, right? And you can record it and listen to it, but it's still pretty hard to deal with. So what we actually do is when we study sound, what we really do is we, we turn it into pictures because we're you know, visual animals, right? So we turn it into pictures, and the most important... Sorry, I forgot that I put that there. So the most important kind of picture is called the sound spectrogram. So I'm going to play a bird song now, again, like this. And I'm going to show you a picture of that sound. So this sound spectrogram here, it's a, it's a graph. It's a three-dimensional graph. And uh, the horizontal axis here, the x-axis, is time. And so you just read it left to right, just like English. So it starts here, and it goes there. And the y-axis, vertical axis, is frequency. And for our purposes today, we can just think of that as pitch. So high pitch is up here, and low pitch is down here. And now we can do all kinds of stuff with the sound, right? It's a lot more tractable. We can count how many notes there are. We can characterize the notes in terms of their frequency and duration and how that frequency changes over time. And we can look at this song here, and you can say, oh, kind of like, kind of starts off a little slow and then speeds up, right? And it kind of goes down in frequency, so a little bit down in pitch, and then a little bit up in pitch. And there's like 30 notes or so. And then at the end, there's this one high pitch note right at the end, right? So I'll play it again and, and watch it on the spectrogram and see if you can follow. Kind of make sense? It's kind of fast though, huh? Let's do, let's do some more. Oops. That's OK. This won't take long. Get it? So that's how sound spectrograms work. Uh, 
Another important idea I got from Dr. Bradbury and Varenkamp's class was that different kinds of songbirds sing different kinds of songs. So here are two closely related species, the swamp sparrow and the song sparrow, and we can look at spectrograms or sonograms of their typical songs here, and we can see that they're different from each other, and we can characterize that difference. Birds, as it turns out, that is songbirds, learn their songs. Just like we learn words when we're little, songbirds learn how to sing their songs. And there's a few different lines of evidence for this, but the, the clearest way that we can show this is with some experiments that were pretty cruel, but taught us an awful lot. So if you take birds like these sparrows here, and instead of letting them listen to adults sing when they're little, and learning the adult songs, you raise them in isolation, they sing songs that look like that. So you can see they sing these degenerate, depauperate songs that lack the structural complexity of normal songs. And that tells us that they, they learn. But the scientists were not satisfied. They went further still, and they deafened the poor little birds. So now, not only can the bird not learn from adults, it can't even hear itself and get auditory feedback on what it's producing. And you can see now that it makes these garbage sounds down here. So birds need to learn their songs. Yeah, it was pretty mean. We don't do that anymore. Some of the consequences of this learning are that songs evolve culturally. Right? So what that means is that you can end up with different cultures in different places, different, um, different kinds of songs in different locations. So people in Newfoundland speak differently than people in Texas or Australia. They have different dialects, and those are learned. And in the same way, birds have different dialects. So if you go to, say, the San Francisco Bay Area, and you record the white-crowned sparrows around the San Francisco Bay, you'll see that in each area, each part of the bay, the birds sing a different kind of song. And where there's a river or an inlet or a big gap in the forest, there's a break between one kind of dialect and another. The white crowned sparrow only sings one song. Each individual just sings one song normally. But a lot of songbirds aren't like that. And a lot of songbirds, an individual can sing many different kinds of songs. So it could be two or five or 10 or 10,000 or a bunch of different numbers in between. And so the set of songs that the bird can sing is called its repertoire. Just like if you're a musician, there's some set of songs that you can sing or play on your instrument. That's your repertoire. An individual bird has a repertoire. And since these songs are learned, different individuals can learn some of the same songs. So I might have a repertoire of 10 songs. You might have a repertoire of 10 songs. And maybe five of those songs are shared between us. And we can both sing them, right? So I can sing Happy Birthday, and so can you. Um, but maybe you can sing He's a Jolly Good Fellow, and I can't. So we share some songs, but we also don't share other songs. And if you share songs, you need something really interesting, which is called song type matching. So one bird might sing some song, and then the other bird next to it, its neighbor, might answer back with the exact same kind of song. That's called song type matching. I'll get back to that later, but it's a mysterious phenomenon. Lots of birds do it, and, and we don't really understand what they're up to. And that's the kind of thing that I like. I mean, so when I was talking about the sloth, what I was talking about is discovery. I'm really driven, you know, professionally as a scientist, I'm really driven by discovery. I really want to find out what the animals are up to, and I want to I want to learn new things that we didn't know about, about what they're doing in their little animal lives. That's what's super interesting to me. And so problems like song type matching are really interesting. There's something orderly happening. Clearly, something is going on. What is it? That's the kind of stuff that really draws me in as a scientist. So I had just gotten back to UCSD after a year off, and I just switched majors, and my GPA was pretty crappy. And so I applied for this education abroad opportunity to go to Costa Rica and learn tropical ecology. And this was what I had always wanted to do. It was exactly 
right up my alley because I would get to go to Central America and, and study animals in the wild. And I begged and pleaded, and I barely scraped in at the bottom of the wait list. And I'm super glad that I did because I learned a million and one things. When I got into the rainforest, man, I just like took my shirt off, and the rain was pouring down, and it was like, it was like everything I wanted it to be. It was like I was, I was back home. And so I was in this program here, and we learned a bunch of great stuff. And it's an amazing program. These programs really change lives. I mean, this person is a professor. Uh, that person is a professor. This guy is one of the most famous science writers right now. He writes for, like, National Geographic and Outside and everything else, The Atlantic. And so that, that absolutely solidified things. You know, I had... I had this sort of vision that I wanted to go to the tropics, that I wanted to go to Central America, and then I got to do it, and it was, it was like better than I thought it would be. And so I, was, I decided, you know, okay, this is, this is cool. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to commit to this. I want to go to graduate school. I want to go get a PhD. So I was in the States. You don't have to get a master's first necessarily. So I went and I got, uh, went and enrolled in a doctorate program. And Again, I, I just did not know what I was doing. I didn't really understand. We didn't really have much internet back then, so it was hard to kind of figure things out and systems out and stuff. I didn't really know what I was doing. There was a list. The university provided a list of different universities that, that had good graduate programs in animal behavior. And I saw Colorado State. And I said, oh, my uncle lives in Colorado. Seems like a nice place. I like the snow. So that's where I applied. So I applied to Colorado State, and I got in. And I went there for grad school. And, uh, and this was my supervisor. I like this picture. I think it really shows how kind and sweet he is. He's there with his granddaughter, Mike Baker. And so I get there, and I meet Mike. This is literally the first day. I meet Mike on the first day. I'm there, and he says, so what do you want to study? He says, I don't know, like lizards or something? <laughs> and, he, and he says, no, 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 no. Look, this is a bird song lab. You have to study bird songs here. And I, I didn't really like birds very much. I, uh, I, really had, I, I really had very little interest in studying birds, but I said, well, uh, do I have to? And he says, well, either that or you have to find a different lab. And I'd already moved out, and we had an apartment and everything, so I decided I would stick around. I said, well, but at least I, I want to go to the tropics. He says, okay, well, we can, we can figure that out. I said, great. So I helped Mike with some of his research. He studied... Um, black-capped chickadees, which are a bird that we have a lot of up here. And so I did some collaborative projects with him. And in one of these projects, we studied this, this sound that the bird makes. It's called a chickadee call. It goes, it's supposed to sound like chickadee-dee-dee, but it really sounds like this. That should probably be familiar to a lot of people, right? It's a real common sound that we hear right here. So that's an interesting... That's an interesting signal acoustically, because that last part, the so-called D note, the uh, 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 at the end, that's a very acoustically complex note. And so the first, the first uh, research program, or first research uh, project that I did with Mike was to study that note. And what we discovered is that each different flock of chickadees has a different structure to their D notes. It sounds the same to us, but if you measure it carefully enough, you can find that they're different. And they use that to recognize their flock. And so when we take these birds that we had in captivity and we would release them back where we found them, here's what they do. They fly to the top of a tree, the closest tree, and then they go And they do that a bunch of times, and then their buddies come and find them. So. Mike had some connections, and he helped me get in with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in 2001, and I got to go to Panama to start my dissertation research. And then after that, I was able to get fellowships and grants and fund my next three years of doctoral research down in central Panama, studying this bird right here, the black-bellied wren. My black-bellied friend, the black-bellied wren. And this picture is the first one that I caught. I didn't really <laughs> sense a theme in this talk. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really know how to catch birds exactly. Mike had taught me one day, but he tried to teach me on a day when it was very cold and there weren't very many birds out. So I didn't actually end up catching a bird myself until I got down to Panama. And I had to 
go into the forest. I went into the forest alone, which is astonishing. And I, and I thought that I heard the right species, but I wasn't sure. It sounded kind of like the recordings. And I set up my nets, and I started the playback. And eventually, I caught this bird. And that's what this picture is. This is me catching the bird for the first time that was going to be the topic of my dissertation. I was very, very happy to have caught it. So this is a black-bellied wren. This is a male here. And this is the kind of habitat they live in, this kind of degraded uh, tropical forest here. So a lot of edge habitat, um, very, very buggy, uh, very viney, very dense. And uh, the male sounds like this. I'm going to play you four different song types. You'll hear a little bit of the variety of what he sings. So, so far we focused on male song, which is, um, which is in line with birdsong science, because birdsong science focused on male song for a very long time. Uh, most birdsong scientists are from Europe and North America, and so they primarily studied European and North American birds. And in Europe and North America, it's mostly the males that sing. And the males sing to defend territories and attract mates. But in the rest of the world, in the tropics, in the southern hemisphere, there's a lot of female song, and that's getting a lot more attention these days. And uh, it turns out that my colleague and collaborator, Karen Odom, discovered a few years back that female song is the ancestral condition in songbirds. So what that means is the common ancestor of all the songbirds, if we go back down the evolutionary tree and think about what's the species that gave rise to the total diversity of songbirds that we see today, in that species, we're now quite confident that females did sing. So absence of female song is what we call a derived character. Females lost song along the way in certain lineages, but female song is the way that things used to be and still are in many species, including the black-bellied wren. And this is what they sound like. So just like the male, she has a repertoire of these complex different kinds of songs that she can sing. And that's cool enough. What are they saying? Yeah, yeah. So I do have an idea of what they're saying and what they're trying to communicate. So the main thing that they're trying to communicate is, this is my territory. And if they're alone, they're trying to get a mate to come to them. But they do other stuff with their song, too. I'm going to talk about a few other things that they use their song for. But it's not like words at all. We really. It, um, we can explain it in words, but animal signals, as far as we can tell, and there's maybe one or two exceptions that we can talk about in the question period if you're interested, uh, animal signals aren't like, well, they're not what's called referential. So that means that they don't just mean something like cat or table or ink pen or something like that. They're, but they function to change the behavior of the other animals in ways that are advantageous to the animal that's giving the signal. So the reason that I went to study these birds is because in addition to the male song and the female song, they put their songs together to make duets. And those sound like this. Sorry, those look like this. And they sound like this. <laughs> I think so too. So when Mike told me that I had to study bird songs, and I said I wanted to work in the tropics, he gave me this book chapter to read, The Study of Bird Sounds in the Neotropics, Urgency and Opportunity. So this book chapter, I read it, and I was trying to find something to do my dissertation on. This was, this was actually the first, first day of graduate school for me. I was reading this book chapter, and I read the whole thing, and I knocked on Mike's door. I said, I think I want to study duetting. To me, this was the sweet spot. It was, it was kind of sexy and kind of cool because the male and the female were doing it together, and I thought that was kind of cool. So it was different than male song, which is what everybody else studied. I liked that it was this really tropical thing because I was super into the tropics, and I liked this idea of going down there and focusing on these tropical birds. And I liked that it was a mystery because nobody knew why they did it. And that was right up my alley. That was exactly what I wanted. It was something that was mysterious, 
tropical, exotic, beautiful. I'm in. Send me to Panama. So I did a bunch of research on these things and wrote papers about their duetting behavior. And I don't have time to get into all the different stuff. But I'm going to talk about one project that we did about the structure of their duets, how they put their songs together to make these duets. So I was in my, um, my office, and I was a graduate student at the time back in Colorado. And it was like a broom closet, basically. It was this tiny little windowless office. And I was scoring trials from a playback experiment that I had done. So what that means is I'd gone to Panama in 2001. I had played songs to the birds and measured their responses. And then I had to listen to the recordings of those experiments and turn them into data that I could analyze. So you're listening, and you're making a bunch of marks on paper at the time. And one of the things that I was scoring was song type switching. So when they switch from one song type to another song type, I'd make a little mark on my piece of paper. And so I'm doing that. I'm all alone. It's late at night in this building. And I make a mark that the male had switched its song type. And then I see that the female switched her song type right afterwards. And I say, oh, that's kind of interesting. The male switched, and then the female switched. That's cool. And then it happened again. The male switched, and right afterward, the female switched too. And I said, well, that, that maybe that's a bit of a pattern. Let's see what's happening here. And so I looked through my old data sheets. There was a big stack of them. I was almost done at this point. And I kind of slapped myself in the head, because I can't believe I didn't see this before. Every time the male switches, the female switches too. And a little light bulb popped, and I had an idea. You guys know what my idea was? I'll show you. OK, let's break this down. I'm going to use this duet that we just played. It's, it's hidden inside this duet, actually. I'm going to show it to you. The first song is the male, and it goes like this. Oh, sorry, I'm going to play the whole duet one more time. I forgot my cues. OK, here's the male, first song. And when he sings that, the female answers like this. But then he switches to a different song type. Can you hear how that's different? And it looks different on the spectrogram too, right? So you can tell it's different. And now the female answers him differently than she answered the other song. And now he does something very convenient for the purposes of this demonstration. He switches back to the first song type. See that? That's the same as the first one. And what does she do? She switches back too. So I had a hypothesis. Here's the hypothesis. OK, I made almost all the slides for this presentation today from scratch, but this one is like from the Bush administration. This one's ancient. So the, the male sings some song, and the female's got a repertoire of songs that she could use to answer him. But I said, maybe she's got rules. Maybe in her brain, there are rules that she uses to answer each of his song types with a particular song type of her own. And if that's the case, then we can kind of think about it like this. Like there's a right answer to that song, right? And then if he sings a different song, she would answer that, and so on. And the name that I made up for this set of rules is the duet code. So it's a code because it connects one set of things to another set of things. So the duet code, I made up this name. I found all these songs that seem to abide by this. But what I really wanted to do was to show a causal relationship. So what I'd found was a correlation. Certain male songs are associated with certain female songs. That's a correlation, right? They come together. But what I wanted to show was that there was a causal relationship that the particular male song caused the female to choose her song type. So as scientists, when we want to go from correlation to causation, our most powerful tool is the experiment. So I ran an experiment. So in this experiment, what I would do is I'd be out there in the jungle with the birds, and I would play a bunch of recordings of duets from some other bird that they didn't know. And this would get them very upset, because they would think that it was a strange pair of birds on their territory. This is what, what you were asking about, really, is the rule is if you sing in a place and it's not your territory, the bird whose territory it is is going to be super angry and chase you off. So sort of de facto, if you're singing in a spot, it's your territory. 
if nobody's chased you off, it's your spot, right? So that's really what they're doing. So when I play these stranger duets from their territory, they get really upset, and they come in close, and the female starts to answer a lot, which is what we needed. We need her to answer every male song. And so then, this is where I play a dirty trick. I switch to a different speaker that's closer to them, and I play recordings of the male. And so now I get to be Dr. Doolittle, because the female is going to sing with me. She's going to duet with me. So we did a bunch of these, and I'm just going to show you a few examples. Here's a real duet right here, just a quick segment of a duet. And you can see that there's this male phrase followed by this female phrase here. And they, the male has like 30 different songs or so, and the female has about 20 that she could sing. And so here's a recording of me playing back. That PB is playback. So I'm playing back a recording of the same male song to the same pair. And you can see that she answers the same way that she did before. And here's another example down here. You can see that she answered the same way as, as she had in real life. And on and on. And it happens, it happens every time. And these are the kinds of patterns that you just don't see in animal behavior. This is uh, basically every time she answers the song, she answers according to this set of rules. So I was really excited to find this uh, strong and robust pattern that these females abide really strongly by these duet codes. And so we learned a few things. We learned, and I won't get into the details of the data, but you can ask later on if you're interested. We learned that females abide by duet codes, that different females have different duet codes, and that these duet codes are stable from year to year. And the idea that they had different ones kind of tells you that they got to be learned, right? I mean, if the songs are learned, then the codes must be learned too, right? And that's kind of a big deal because then we got some interesting things happening. Not only do birds learn their songs, like people learn words, but they learn how to put their songs together, like people learn how to have conversations, right? I really wanted to study the development of this, and I applied for a bunch of grants, but they didn't get any. But somebody else did. And her name is Carla Rivera, and she did some really cool work with a very closely related species following up on the duet code. And she published these recordings right here as part of her study, which I really liked. So this is, these are colored spectrograms here. And you can see that an adult male and female are duetting with each other, and their daughter is getting involved too. And what does she do? Well, she tries to copy mom's part. And she gets pretty good at it by here, doesn't she? I had observed this behavior as well in the black-bellied wrens. So the kids practice their duets with their parents. And they learn by practicing along with their folks. And they learn these rules Carla showed when they're little kids. But then, and this part's even cooler, I think, when they're adults, and they mate, they refine and change their rules, and they learn each other's rules. So the male learns his mate's rule, and she learns his rules. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. One thing I like about that, and I think needs to be followed up, is that um, we're talking about brain flexibility, the ability to learn at different phases in life. So the brain is flexible and able to learn this code when they're little, and then it becomes flexible again and able to learn these rules again as adults. Nobody's followed up on that yet. So I said I did a bunch of studies on these black-bellied wrens. I'm just going to summarize a few that I think might be of interest uh, to you all. So the musical, the musical uh, uh, perspective on duetting has been really interesting to me. And, and as a musician, you know, in order to play in time with other musicians, everybody needs to keep the beat, but everybody needs to listen as well. And I was interested to see if that was the case in these birds. Because um, you can imagine a situation where that's not true, right? You can imagine that maybe they just have sort of a fixed rhythm, and they both start at the same time, and that's good enough. Uh, it turns out that's not the case. Both pair members, both the male and the female, keep a steady beat, and both also adjust to their partner's tempo. This one year we went down there, I think it was mm, 2003, we went down there and um, we radio tagged the birds. So we would put a, a radio on the male and the female, and then we could try to follow them around with radio receivers. So I had a, I had a, um, a research assistant at the time, 
and we were tromping around in the jungle, uh, pre-GPS, trying to figure out where these birds were. And that was really cool. We got some really cool data. And what I was interested in was this idea that they might use the duets to find each other in their dense forest habitat. And that's actually what we found. They use duets like kids playing Marco Polo. So the one bird sings, <whistles> and then its mate answers, <whistles> and then he'll go and find her afterwards. Both sexes do it. The male uses it to find the female, and the female uses it to find the male. And then regarding the function, the, the utility of these duets, I did a bunch of studies on that. And my conclusion, and, and the, I'd say pretty much the consensus of the duetting community now, is that duets are a signal of cooperative territory defense. So duets signal that pair mates are close together. They don't do it when they're far apart. They only do it when they're close together. They signal that the pair mates are close together and that they're going to defend their territory cooperatively. So in that way, duets are like collective signals in a lot of different animals that you'd be familiar with. So think about like a pack of wolves all howling together. The other wolves will know, oh, there's 10 wolves over there and they're all in a pack. So maybe we shouldn't go invade their territory, right? Or uh, a pride of lions that are roaring together, roaring in a chorus, right? It's a very similar kind of thing. So like Matt said, after grad school, I was broke. I moved into my mom's basement. I was tutoring kids and like math and stuff. And I, uh, I applied for every job I could find. And I got a job up here at the U of L. And I met April up here. And I had a great postdoc, but I was mostly studying insects, so I'm not really going to talk about that too much today. After I was done with that, I got uh, my first faculty position at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez in Western Puerto Rico, and that was awesome. I taught a bunch of classes. I was in the bio department, so I was teaching evolution, and I got a bunch of people super involved in research and met. I had like, awesome graduate students. It was a fantastic experience. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the research I did then. But the important thing for today's talk is that I started this new study system on Adelaide's warbler. So this is an Adelaide's warbler. They live in Puerto Rico. They are very small. Um, the male and the female kind of look alike. And they live uh, all over the island. We study them in the dry forest in the uh, southwestern part of the island. And their song is very different from the black-bellied wren song. It goes like this. The black-bellied wren, remember, had that sort of low, rich. <whistles> so those low and slow songs are typical of birds that live in dense forests. So in Panama, these birds live in, in dense rainforest. It's very noisy, and there are a lot of trees and leaves and vines that generate reverberation. So none of the birds that live in the dense rainforest sing rapid songs. Because if they did, they would just turn into a blur with all that noise and reverberation. So when you have dense, acoustically complex habitat, you always have slow songs evolving. Adelaide's warbler lives in less dense habitat. Where I study them, it's a dry forest, so it's pretty open. Kind of think of like acacia, like mixed scrub acacia that you might see like in Africa or something like that. That's kind of like what it's like. And so they are able to evolve much faster songs. So they've evolved these very fast trills. And I think it's to show off their singing ability. I'll talk a, a little teeny bit about that in a minute here. So I was at the University of Puerto Rico for, uh, for a while. And then I got that faculty position at the UofL. And that's where I'm at right now. And, and so this is my research program right now. I study interactive singing. So interactive singing is like, Remember that sender-receiver model that we were talking about, where there's a sender and it signals and the receiver receives it? In interactive signaling, individuals are both senders and receivers. So the same individual can signal and also hear signals, and they'll go back and forth, just like in duetting. Right? So this is, duetting got me interested in this. It's kind of like conversations. And now I'm studying not just duetting, but also what's called countersinging. And that happens when there are different males, so, or individuals, we're using males, different individuals each on their own territory, and they're singing to each other. So they sing back and forth to each other. So I'm going to talk about that some. Um, we study performance, which is like singing ability. 
and I'm going to just touch on that pretty briefly. And we study song type repertoires, having different kinds of songs. Why do birds sing different song types? How do they use them? And that kind of stuff. This last spring, uh, I went back to my field site in Puerto Rico for the first time since the pandemic and brought a bunch of students with me. Um, I'm going to talk to you some about what we did there. Um, one thing that we did is my former student, Tanya Martinez, came and um, shot a bunch of documentary footage um, to make a little, a little documentary of our trip. And this is the, uh, I think it's going to be the opening scene to the documentary. It might look a little familiar to you. The background sound, before I start this, the background sound that you're going to hear is what's called the dong chorus. So early in the morning, in many places in the world, including in Lethbridge, lots and lots of birds sing a lot. Okay. This is a really widespread phenomenon. It's something that we've been interested in my lab for a while. Uh, it's called the dong chorus. And I kind of made a dong chorus to go along with this little video clip here. So that's the dong chorus in uh, Cabo Rojo Wildlife Refuge in Puerto Rico. And uh, most of what you were hearing were Adelaide's warblers, all those high trills, uh, the birds that we study. But there's a bunch of other birds there that sing during the dong chorus. And my graduate student, uh, Julie Vasquez, is in the back there. For her master's, she was studying the dong chorus. And uh, there she is in the field. So this is the only graph in the whole presentation. So what she was, I think, I hope, what she was studying was this idea of performance that I kind of touched on before and how it changes over the course of the morning. So I'm not really going to talk in detail about how we measure performance, but you can kind of think about it as how fast the birds sing, so their ability to sing really fast trills. On the y-axis here, we see the time relative to sunrise. So the sun rises right at zero. And then if we go back, that's earlier, and that was later. And then here we have performance. So higher means better performance. It's harder for the bird to sing. Here are the data. So this part right here, before dawn, this is the dawn chorus. You can see there's lots and lots of songs here. The birds are singing a lot. And if we look at the trend, you can see that when they first wake up in the morning, they're singing with the lowest performance they're going to sing all day. And it increases rapidly during the dawn chorus when they're all singing a lot. And then it levels off from there on out. I said, wow, it's like they're warming up. In fact, I think it's exactly like they're warming up. Just like a singer would warm up her voice before a concert, or an athlete would warm up their muscles before a race, these birds seem to be warming up their voices by singing intensely first thing in the morning. So we went back last spring to do a project that I've been wanting to do for a very long time. I've probably been thinking of this project for 10 years. And uh, I was very happy to have the opportunity to finally do it. So in the sender-receiver model, there's one sender and there's one receiver. We've already talked about interaction such that they can both be senders and receivers. And we're going to keep that idea in mind. But now we're going to add more individuals. Because that's how things really are, right? There's not really just an isolated sender and receiver that have this communication interaction. There's really a bunch of birds all over the forest that are all communicating with each other in a complex web or network. So I'm going to talk about what we did, and I'm going to talk about what the data are looking like now. This was just last year, so we don't have it all figured out yet. There's still a lot left to do. But the kinds of questions that I wanted to answer with this research are things like, how do they choose which song type to sing next? 
Why do they match song types? And what new can we learn from studying communication at the network level? This is a new way of doing things. People have done a little bit of network stuff in birds before, but not with birds that have different song types like these birds. So there's, this is, um, it was a new way of doing things, and the reason's pretty straightforward. It's just hard. Birds are very small, and they fly around in dense forest, and it's hard to follow them. And the reason that we were able to do this is because first thing in the morning, when they're singing the dawn chorus, they don't. It's still pretty dark. They don't fly very much. They pretty much stay in one place. So this allowed us to record them where they were. And I'll show you how we did that. So we had this great crew, uh, field assistants from Puerto Rico, a bunch of biology students. I recruited a bunch of biology students. And, uh, and people here from uh, Canada, I got a grad student from the United States as well. And we all went to Puerto Rico last spring to do all this field work. And, you know, it's not exactly like a field course, but I do, I like the idea that maybe some of these people are going to have experiences in the forest that open their eyes and get them excited about ecology and behavior the same way that that field course in Costa Rica did for me. And I also like the idea of training scientists in tropical countries. That was a big part of the reason I really wanted to go to Puerto Rico and be a professor there. There's been this north temperate bias, is what they call it, um, forever in science. The scientists have come from Europe and North America, and so they tend to study things in Europe and North America, and they tend to be interested in, in things in Europe and North America, and they tend to have a European and North American perspective on science. And so um, it's just great to see more and more scientists coming from Latin America where there is such fantastic diversity. And that's something that I'm trying to do uh, with the rest of my career is try to, try to help promote science, uh, particularly in Latin America, because that's where I do my work. So we got to catch the birds. We got to catch the birds for a few different reasons. The main reason is, is that we need to put markers on them so we know which, which individuals are which. The way we catch the birds is with a mist net. There's different ways to catch birds. We use mist nets. This is a mist net. It's kind of like a, a volleyball net, but it goes all the way down to the ground. And the net is made of this very fine, fine mesh. So you can kind of see it billowing in the wind there. There are like pockets that sort of form out. And then there's these sort of heavy lines that go horizontally down the length of the mist net. And what I do here is the birds are, um, they respond very strongly to playback of their own songs because they're highly territorial. So I got one little Bluetooth speaker hidden in here, and then we hide another little Bluetooth speaker over here. And I play song out of this one for a while until the bird that we want to catch has kind of come down over here. And then when we see it's down there, we trick it because we got big brains and they got tiny little brains. And I switch to that speaker, and then it flies through there, hopefully, and we catch it. We catch a bunch of other stuff, too, and that's kind of cool. We catch a bunch of, bunch of weird birds. And then you got to get them out, and that's a bit of a trick. It takes, it, it, you got to learn how to do it. Don't try this at home. The key is to make sure that you know which side they came in on. If they do, they can get hurt. Yeah, for sure. They're really delicate. Um, I mean, I don't hurt them, but I've been doing it for a long time. Um, it's hard. One of the challenges of training students how to do this is they've got to do it to learn how to do it, right? It's a hands-on thing, and you've got to do it. So you try to show them, and you try to, try to supervise it. But, you know, they're a little rougher on the birds. Um, but the birds, they recover. They do fine. They do fine. Yeah, this one's a little bit longer than I wanted it to be, but I thought editing out the middle wouldn't work. I think you feel I feel like you got to see the bird get out though. There we go. Liberty. So then we got the bird. Tiny tiny little bird. And I got this cool tackle box with all this cool gear in it bunch of little colored rings. So these colored rings are going to go on their legs to identify the individuals. That's how we identify them. 
We take a bunch of measurements and stuff. Sometimes we take blood. We didn't do that this year, though. That does hurt them. So you can see here that we put four bands on their legs. This one has all four. So there's three plastic bands and a metal band. The metal band isn't that interesting to me, but I have to put it on. Uh, Fish and Wildlife requires it. It's got a unique number. The plastic bands are what I care about. So each individual has a unique combination of colored plastic bands, and that's, that's how we know who's who. And in fact, that's how we name them. So this person, this, this bird would be V for violet, DG, dark green, O for orange. So VDGO would be that bird. And there, this would be YYLB, and then he would be uh, WRBRB, I think, for royal blue. So we, we catch all of our birds that we need in the area that we're studying them. We mark them all. And then we go out there real, real, real early in the morning with a big crew, and everybody's got digital recorders and directional microphones that they're going to use to record the birds. Oh, I missed my cool cue. OK. So this is, this is the part of the study that I had envisioned like three years before we actually got to the study. And it's small and trivial, but I got to tell you, I bought a dog clicker. And I had everybody turn on your microphones, point your, clicker, point your microphone at me, and I'm going to make a click. There it was. Why did I do that? So you can sync up all the recordings afterwards. It's like the, the director's board, right? So then everybody goes out, and they've all got their phones with them. Everybody's got their phones. You've got to bring your phone to the field these days. Because the night prior, I'd sent everybody an updated map of the field site on Google Earth. And so there we are on Google Earth on our phones. And the sun hasn't come up yet. And you can see yourself. You're that little blue dot. And you can see all these different little trees where we've seen the birds before, the different places the birds like to hang out. And as you're walking around, you can see where you are in relation to where all the birds are. And so each person is assigned to record one bird at one of these territories. And we, we worked in regions. So this is sort of the, the north neighborhood, and the central neighborhood, and the southern neighborhood here. And then they would record the birds for the whole dawn chorus. And then we would listen to the recordings painstakingly. There's a program called Raven, Raven Pro. It comes out of Cornell. And you can turn these big, long recordings into big, long sonograms. And you identify where each song is. And then it says where it begins and ends here. And you can make comments and notes and stuff like that. So that's a big part of what we do is turn the sound into data. And um, we have different programs that we use for different things. We use a different program to make fine scale measurements of the sound. Uh, we use a different program for doing statistics and stuff like that. And like I say, we're just kind of getting into this now. But there's a, there's a few new things I can show you. And these are new. These are brand new. And uh, it's like a world premiere, actually. You guys are going to see these data before anybody else does. So here's a new map. You saw the old map that we used in the field. This one looked pretty familiar, pretty similar. It's the same territories. But now instead of the trees where we've seen them, these are actually where they sing their songs. So each one of those dots is a place where a bird sings its song. And when they're darker and more opaque, that means they sang lots of songs in that place. So we have the location for every song that we recorded. And when you take the data and you put it all together, maybe I lied about the graphs. I think there is actually another graph coming up. And you put it all together. This is just for. Uh, for one neighborhood. I'm going to show you five days from one of our neighborhoods here. I think this gives you a cool idea of sort of the scale of what we're able to do and maybe some ideas about what you can learn from these kinds of data. So each one of these is a day. And each row is a bird. Time is here. And each mark is a song. Different colors represent different types of songs. So we can look at things like rates and switching rates, what kinds of songs they learn or use, the patterns, all these different kinds of things. And soon, we don't have the data set up just right yet. We're going to be able to identify all of the song type matches that are happening in here, too. So we've got three times this much from this one field season. So I'm feeling really good about that. When you zoom in, you get a bunch of other cool information. Because you can actually now see this is like a detail 
of the other image that I just showed you a minute ago. Now you can see the duration of each of these songs and how each bird follows each other bird. And we have locations associated with all of these too. So we're, we just got a, a huge amount of, of really exciting data. And, uh, and why don't I show you one more thing that we discovered here recently. I was really excited to find this. So here's a different way of looking at it. Now we're actually looking at the sound itself, and we're really zoomed in just on one sort of set of songs here. So these are all synchronized recordings. These are all happening in real time related to each other. And here we have each of the different individual birds in this neighborhood here. So they're named after their tags, right? RRO is red, red, orange. And, uh, and what you see here is something that has never been shown before and really gets to the heart of what this network communication project is about. This is five-way song type matching. You can see all of these birds, except for this guy, saying the exact same song type here. They've got like 30 different songs they could sing, so this isn't a coincidence. They do this a lot. They do this a lot. They're very much influencing each other's songs uh, all morning long. I looked through one of these files and just sort of eyeballed matches, and there was a song type match every 11 seconds. And a lot of them were two or three and four and even five-way matches. So they are definitely a communication network. They're definitely influencing each other. And I really look forward to getting deeper into the data and learning what else they're up to. Uh, this is my thank you slide. Thanks to everybody that provided images and video. Big thanks to my family and my friends and my teachers and colleagues and students. Thanks to Catherine Reeder for setting this up. She did an awesome job. I really appreciate everything you did, Catherine. And to Sound Barrier for the sound.